Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Nicole Galvan, and welcome to episode five of Truth, Lies, and Puppy Mills, Bailing Out Benji's podcast. Um, I am here with Ashley. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ashley Dale, the Washington State team leader. And I'm Mindy Callison, the founder and executive director. And we did it. We're at episode five. That's so exciting. Ooh, yay. <laughs> we already have 1,200 listeners. That's so cool. That's really, really great. I was yes. not expecting that at all. <laughs> no, me either. I was like, let's just do this. It'll be fun. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. well, we're so thank you guys for people. tuning in to us. <laughs> And we're getting really, really great feedback from other advocates that are saying that they're learning something every single episode, which is really cool. And I just love that we have a way to kind of show the world what we do and and how we do it. And because um, so much stuff happens behind the scenes that I think people, it, it's hard to convey exactly all the stuff we're working on and, and what's going on behind the scenes. So this has been awesome for us to educate and inspire people to do their own advocacy. And yeah, it's been wonderful. So yay, episode yeah. five. And I'm Nicole Galvan. I'm the Arizona team leader for Bailing Out Benji and um, and our host. <laughs> <We're> all, <laughs> and uh, we, we had guests on last uh, episode for episode four. We had three uh, former pet store employees. And then Ashley and I were hosting and um, that was really interesting. That was very intense. And um, there was, there were tears. <laughs> it yeah. was a very difficult episode. Um, I knew it would be, I've talked to lots of former employees um, of pet stores across the country. And I knew that they kind of all have their own set of horror stories. So I, I figured that was going to be hard and it was. But yeah, this uh, was my first time talking to anybody that had worked at a pet store. And it's like, you have ideas about what goes on, but to actually hear exactly what they experienced was, it was eye opening, even as an advocate that is aware, you know, so I can only imagine how eye opening it was for the public to hear those stories. Yeah, right. I was speaking to a few of our listeners and supporters, and they said the same thing, you know, they've been working against puppy mills for years and they've heard the stories of puppy mills and pet stores, but what they heard from the employees was stuff they had never actually heard spoken by employees. They've always thought it happened, but hearing what really happens behind the scenes was heartbreaking and eye-opening for a lot of our listeners. Yeah, and uh, we actually will probably revisit that topic again in the future. Um, we do have uh, several other former employees that we can talk to, um, some of them more recent, some of them from years ago, and they all pretty much have this very similar uh, horror stories, unfortunately, of what's going on behind the scenes at pet stores. So yeah, so this week we are talking about a uh, topic that we are all very hot and heavy about. <laughs> this is, uh, we're talking about dog brokers. So um, there are, the USDA allows, well, actually, Mindy, I'll have you explain uh, the definition of dog brokers, because you're uh, probably the most familiar with all the brokers in the country. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, a dog broker is a term for a USDA licensed class B dealer. So we all use the term broker pretty loosely, but they are licensed and inspected by the USDA as dealers. And that is a class B license where um, animal breeders are a class A license. And so these are facilities that literally work in the buying and reselling of animals. So dogs, cats, small animals, anything bred in a commercial facility, they are purchased by a broker, by this dealer, and then flipped to pet stores, to animal testing facilities, and um, other things like that. So while most of the animals are sold to pet stores, there is a small, small subset that go to animal research facilities and animal testing facilities. Nearly every single pet store across the country is using a dog broker to bring puppies to their facility, to their pet store, to resell puppies to the public. 
currently, there are around 800 USDA facilities, USDA dog brokers right now in the country. So this is a very, very big part of the puppy mill industry, but it's not very well known and it's not very well talked about. Yeah, and um, the way I see these brokers is uh, basically, it's a great way for puppy mills to hide behind another layer. It's, it just adds that extra layer of, um, you know, secrecy on top of an industry that's already very secretive. <laughs> so right. um, yeah, here in Arizona, we have, uh, we have a law that says that pet stores can't get uh, puppies from puppy mills that have a violation, a direct violation on their USDA inspection reports in the last two years, or they have to have three, I think it's, or yeah, three or fewer uh, indirect violations. And um, so when we look at our records and we see that a lot of the dogs are coming in from brokers, it just makes me feel like, well, those dogs could have come in from the worst puppy mills in the country and they were filtered through a broker. So the record, the public records are showing that they're coming in from these brokers and, and they really could have just come from anywhere. <laughs> they could have come from a horrible hundred puppy mills or just about anywhere. And they're, you know, then the broker gets them and then they take them to the pet store. So it's really a, a, a great way for the industry to stay secretive and to keep uh, the public um, at bay and, and, and make sure that they're not, you know, there's not a good way for us advocates to find out what's really going on and where these puppies are really coming from. So to me, the whole idea of, of these brokers is really problematic just in general. <laughs> and I'm not sure why they allow this, why this, is, why this even exists. I guess, I mean, there's room for it in the industry. There's puppy mills all over the Midwest and these pet stores want to get puppies from them. So somebody's going to inevitably, you know, become that middleman, but it really adds that other extra layer of secrecy. Our pet store also uses a broker and, you know, their big line that they tell the public is that they go and visit all of their breeders and they handpick the breeders that they use. But the reality is when you use a broker, that's not possible. It's essentially these brokers gather all these puppies from puppy mills and then put them in a truck and distribute them to different pet stores. These pet stores really don't have an idea what breeder these dogs are coming from until they end up in their store and the public has no way to do their research ahead of time. Right. And so, you know, something that, you know, we, we see behind the scenes is that these pet stores and these brokers and these puppy mills, they all use the same online programs to buy and place orders for puppies. So examples of those online programs are like kennel biz, Dog on Web, Pet Exchange, and the Canine Pedigree. And I'm sure there are more out there. These are just the ones we know about. But this website exists, these programs exist to be kind of like Amazon. So every single facility has a page and a pet store can log on at any time of night. So if they want to place an order for puppies at 2 a.m., they log on to this website, they start clicking whatever breeds of puppies they think they want to sell next week, and they can basically dump all of these puppies into a cart. And then their broker that they use will find those puppies in the Rolodex of breeders that they have. And then they will, you know, get ready to sell those puppies to the pet stores. So really, it's still a click and ship type transaction. Everything is done online now. All of the health certificates are in this program. Um, APR registry, AKC registry, everything is accessible in these programs. So it really takes the research out of it. These breeders aren't, or these pet stores aren't visiting the facilities. And if they are, it's a very small, small subset of facilities they're visiting. Um, one of the largest brokers in Iowa admitted that she uses over 600 breeders. She has a Rolodex for her words of over 600 breeders that she buys puppies from. And so the pet store that Ashley was referring to in Washington, they use Jack's Puppies, this broker, exclusively. And we know that those pet store owners at Puppy Land in Washington are not visiting 600 different facilities to make sure those puppies are coming from a good place. 
And this breed or this broker, excuse me, is able to provide all three of their pet stores with puppies every single week, along with we've found even because these brokers will use a generic background for all of their puppies. So we have matched up litter mates from that are being transported to Washington, to their Idaho store, to their San Antonio store, and even to pet lands all the way on the East Coast in Florida. It's like these brokers that just shows the volume of breeders that these brokers are pulling from. It is hundreds and hundreds of breeders. And what I always find interesting, if you go to our website, um, our maps.bailingoutbenji.com, uh, we have puppy mill maps where you can kind of see what's going on in your neighborhood as far as, or in your county, as far as uh, how many puppy mills are there are. On our website on maps.bailingoutbenji.com, um, you can see where there's puppy mills in your area, in your county. And um, what I always find interesting about these brokers is if you look at where these brokers are located, these massive puppy mill brokers that are getting pup, you know, from all the puppy mills in the Midwest, and you can see that like that brokers located in Neosho, Missouri is like, for instance, is Pinnacle Pet, one of the very large brokers. And then all over Neosho and that whole county and the surrounding counties, there's, that's where a whole bunch of puppy mills are concentrated because it's been, it's the, that broker establishing themselves there has made it very easy for all the neighboring farmers to start getting into the puppy mill industry because that broker is just going to be right there very close by to pick up all their puppies and ship them out like a factory. And um, so I always find that interesting about our, our maps is that you can identify where these brokers are located and then see the, the like springing up all these puppy mills in that area because it just makes it easy for for them to have a puppy mill if you know they can just call them over and they can pick up the puppies every week and it, it just makes it so much easier for the industry to function and unfortunately just like a, a product and and just like a factory and you're exactly right so these brokering companies, they're literally warehouses for puppies. So in a 2018 lawsuit that we obtained um, where Jack's puppies owner, Jolyn Noweth, was a plaintiff, she was explaining the whole process of owning, you know, a brokering company. And so the attorneys were questioning her and she admitted that her facility is a warehouse. She has a warehouse for puppies. And I believe the last USDA inspection we have for her facility had 233 puppies on her facility. So this is literally a large windowless building. Uh, if you're here in the Midwest, you know what a Quonset building is, a Morton building, you know, that's what these puppies are living in. And in this lawsuit, she even said that when these, you know, puppy mills are placing orders, sometimes at 2 a.m. in the morning, they place puppy or they place orders Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, and everything ships out on Sunday. So these facilities, these huge warehouses are collecting puppies all week long, and then they live at a warehouse until they are sold to a pet store. And most pet store puppies before they're eight weeks old have exchanged hands four times. So they've gone from breeder to broker, to transport company, to pet store. So they have exchanged hands four times before they even find a forever family of their own or just get purchased and then, you know, dumped later. So it's a crazy secretive industry that a lot of people just don't know enough about. And something that I've seen on the pet store documents that we've gotten from uh, former customers of pet stores um, who, you know, inevitably bought a a sick puppy and then they've handed us their documents. I noticed that the the puppies, um, because they're in this factory like environment, they're very likely to spread disease to each other. Like, you know, when they're picking up, when they're going in a truck and picking up all the puppies from all the puppy mills there, and then they're cramming them into one truck and then they're cramming them into one warehouse, they're very, very likely to spread disease to each other. So on the documents that I've seen um, from pet store puppies that we, that we would look at and be like, that's a, a huge red flag. Um, but customers, unfortunately, don't know what to look at. But what I see is that the uh, the puppies are given antibiotics, uh, antibiotics and like uh, dewormer and all these medications. They're given that by the breeder um, because of the environment that they're being born into is very ripe for um, infections of various kinds and, and pathogens and 
um, parasites. And then, um, and then they're handed over to the broker and they're given more medication because the broker doesn't want these puppies sick on their, you know, while they're handling them and, and spreading the disease there at their facility, they inevitably do, but they, they try to pump them with more medications and then they get, go over to the transport company and then they might give them more medications and then they go to the pet store and they give them more medications. So these, these puppies, because of this factory like environment, they're like pumped with medications from, you know, the breeder all the way through the broker process and the transport process over to the pet stores. Um, so that's just what I've noticed on these documents. And then also here in Arizona, we, um, our pet stores, they claim the same thing. They, they, I mean, like we've said before, it's like they all go to the same class <laughs> to learn what to say. And they all say the same thing. They say that they visit all of their breeders and our pet stores also use uh, these large scale brokers and uh, they, and then we know that they're using, you know, 150 breeders a year. There's no way they visited 150 breeders when their little breeder trip, quote unquote, that they go on um, is about two weeks long. And I've mentioned that before that there's no way they could visit all those breeders. But yeah, they use these very large brokers. And then, um, yeah, it becomes a problem for us because we can't see exactly where those puppies came from. We just know they came from this large broker and that's it um, as far as what we can show on our, our public documents. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's the problem we have here is, is that they can circumvent the law. They can literally use these brokers to circumvent the law if they wanted to. Um, and there's no way anybody would be able to catch them because if the, if the puppy came in on a broker, that's all we're able to see. And then uh, that's it. but they, the puppy could originally have come from uh, a puppy mill that is not allowed by our state laws. So, right. our pet store. Um, on back, going back to those documents that you were referring to, I counted on one of the vet records that we received from a customer who got a sick puppy. They were dewormed and treated for Giardia twelve times by the time they got to the pet store. I was like. Wow. Yeah, deworming is normal to a point. Um, and they started at like two days old. And then they also had had all of their core DHPP vaccines by the time they were eight weeks old. And I'm just like, this is just leading to more problems with these puppies as they get older. And we've seen it that they're becoming resistant to antibiotics because a handful of these documents that we've received from consumers also show that their dog upon being sold still had worms and still had Giardia, even though they've received all of these antibiotics for them. It's because it's just not working anymore. They've had so much pumped into their poor little bodies that it's not going to work anymore. I do want to add one thing for our listeners. When Ashley says our store and Nicole says our store, they're talking about the pet stores we're exposing in their state. <laughs> Sorry, Puppyland. <laughs> Puppyland is our highest selling pet store. We only have three main stores that are selling puppies, uh, Fairwood in Renton, and they were the ones that were using Ida's Toy Box here, who was a local breeder on the Horrible 100 list. And then Alley Cat, which we can't figure out who exactly they're using because they source locally and there's no CVIs required for those. But Puppyland has imported over 2,000 dogs to that one store since being open. So they are by far the largest puppy mill importer here in Washington. So when we're talking about importing dogs, it's always about Puppyland because they're the only one doing it. <laughs> So I actually pulled a very interesting fact that I thought you two would be uh, crazy. It's crazy to hear. Um, we all know the Hunt Corporation. Uh, they sold out and they became choice puppies. So they were like the largest broker for the longest time in the entire world. So their building is up for sale. And this is what the article had to say. The former choice puppies location is a 200 thousand square foot building that houses business offices and a 10 million dollar climate controlled kennel a grooming shop trucking bays a surgery room an examination room a warehouse and a retail pet store so right. that was the largest broker in missouri at the time and now of course their massive facilities up for sale but that's how big these places are and you know these every single dog broker 
is making millions of dollars a year. So back to that um, lawsuit that I was referencing earlier, Jolyn Noeth, the owner of Jack's Puppies, admitted to making roughly, her words, 20 to $30 million in gross revenue in 2016 and 2017. So if there are eight, right, if there are 800 USDA facilities across the country, and just one of them is making $15 million a year, this is a billion dollar industry that the public is directly funding. It is insane. It is crazy to think about. And JoLynn, for um, anyone who doesn't know, she's also the, the puppy mill in Iowa that started two fake rescues. And in 2016 or 2017 and in 2018, each year, her nonprofit quote unquote rescue made over $400,000 a year selling puppies. So these guys, they don't care where the puppies come from. They don't care about where they're being sold to. All they want to do is make money. They want to be that middleman who literally profits off of technically the laziness of the puppy mill and the laziness of the pet store because these two businesses don't want to do business with each other directly because that's when you have to you know, figure out the sales and figure out the transport. If you buy from a broker, all of that is handled. It's easy peasy and the broker gets away making millions of dollars a year. And then- they all profit so much off of it because the mills are selling these dogs for what? hundred dollars maybe so, so i have know. a i have a sale sheet here yeah. from an illinois pet store <laughs> and it's a pet land so they are selling siberian huskies are buying excuse me siberian huskies for six hundred dollars a piece and then if they'll sell them pet- for about four grand it's exactly. insane exactly so all of these little brokers are selling you know buying the puppies even cheaper reselling them to pet stores for cheap and the pet stores are ripping off the customers by selling them for thousands yep yeah and then you mentioned that um at that facility that was a choice puppies facility hunt corp um they had a surgery center and the first thing that went through my mind is when we've looked at documents before um from the pet store uh, I think it, oh no, actually it was, it's, uh, the CVI documents where I've seen this, where I will see on the CVI documents that the puppy has already been neutered at like just a few weeks old. It'll like the CVI will just know puppy was neutered. And that's like immediately what, what went through my head is I've seen evidence that these, um, breeders and the brokers, are having to, for some reason, probably a genetic issue, um, neuter the puppies when they're very, very, very young. And I, I mean, that's the only reason I imagine they would neuter them that that tiny and that little. Right. Um, and also like they don't neuter the dogs, like as a, it, just generally speaking, they, I mean, the, all these people, these breeders, these pet stars, they don't get the dogs fixed before they sell them to the public. So the fact that I've seen that noted on the CVI is that there have been very, very young puppies neutered. I imagine there was some sort of genetic, major genetic issue for them to, to do that. And so when you said that that place had a surgery center, that's what went through my mind is how horrific <laughs> that is that they just kind of factory farm these animals and then they come through, you know, this distribution center. Oh, they identified a problem. They're just going to snip it real quick and and then move it along down, you know, basically down the the belt. <laughs> so right, I think that actually is very likely that that's the case that they had a genetic issue. We actually received a complaint from somebody, and Jax neutered this very young puppy, and I thought that was strange. And then later on, we find out this puppy has hip dysplasia and a luxating patella. So it's like they're doing a surgery, spaying and neutering this puppy, and then selling it without disclosing any of those other details. It's, yeah, the only people, well, the customers are suffering and these poor animals are suffering. And it's just more of that secretive part of this industry. It goes all the way through to the pet stores. Right. This is kind of its own pyramid scheme, isn't it? Right. (laughs) Like the public is at the bottom and they're the ones who are getting all of the money sucked out of them. Mm -hmm. And then you go up the pyramid and everybody else is making money off of the suffering of puppies and puppy mill dogs. Yeah. And then uh, we mentioned, you know, how they're pumped with medications, uh, the whole, through the whole process. 
and uh, they're in this factory like environment. These are actual warehouses where they're housing all these puppies. Um, I have seen inspection reports that show that some of these very large brokers will have like 300 puppies um, at their facility at once when the inspector was there. And then the following year, they'll have like 12 puppies on the location at the time the inspector was there, the same broker. I've seen, you know, this huge fluctuation of how many puppies are, are at their facility at the time of, of the USDA inspection. So um, yeah, there it's literally just, just a warehouse, just a factory, a little uh, temporary stop. And of course that's creating an environment where disease can be spread very easily. And sure enough, um, there was a huge outbreak of a bacteria that affected humans and puppies. Um, and a lot of humans contracted this, uh, this bacteria through pet store puppies. They went and bought pet store puppies and then they ended up getting very, very sick from this uh, new bacteria that uh, came about because of the factory farm nature of these puppies. Um, and the uh, person uh, or the kennel involved is uh, the Blue Ribbon Kennels. And uh, Mindy, why don't you go ahead and, and talk about Blue Ribbon? <laughs> so the disease you were talking about was Campylobacter. And in a two month period or two year period, excuse me, over 118 people got sick in 13 states. So the CDC got involved. The Center for Disease Control had to step in and start investigating because so many people were getting sick from pet store puppies, including Petland's own employees. They were getting sick, they were getting sent to the hospital, and through the CDC's, you know, tracing, they found out that most of the puppies were coming from a very large broker in Indiana. Uh, it's Blue Ribbon Puppies, owned by Levi Graber, and this facility sells just as many puppies as Jack's Puppies does, if not more. So in a year or two period, this one Amish broker is making at least $20 million a year. I can safely say that when I've seen how many CVIs are coming out of his facility. And this is the same thing that's happening across the country. Like Nicole mentioned, these are USDA facilities and they, they breed disease. And so another very problematic broker that is in Missouri is Tiffany's LLC. And she sells puppies to pet stores all over the country as well. In a six month time period, she had 35 puppies die in her facility, according to the state of Missouri inspector who went on the property, at least 13 of those died from Parvo. So these breeders, these brokers, these transport companies are literally facilitating the grossest diseases, the most contagious diseases. And if they don't kill the puppies, if they don't infect the puppies, they're infecting the consumer. And Campylobacter, it, it shows itself, it manifests as kind of like the stomach bug, but it gets very, very severe. And please keep in mind, this whole outbreak happened like before COVID. So, you know, it seemed like a really, really big deal at the time, but Families were getting hospitalized. I was contacted by someone here in Iowa who bought a Christmas puppy last December. And by the middle of January, 2020, her three-year-old daughter had to be hospitalized with a 103 degree temperature. She was so sick that this little three-year-old could not even be taken care of at home. She had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. Thankfully, she's okay, but that's what happens with these employees and these customers. You play with a puppy, you don't know what you're coming in contact with, and then you go home and you take Parvo home to your pet, you take Campylobacter to your three-year-old daughter. There's so many illnesses that manifest in these filthy pet stores that look clean to the naked eye, but the diseases live on the surface for weeks. And, uh, for the Arizona people listening, um, I, you know, I'm in Arizona, so um, our pet stores here are you, they used uh, Levi Graber Blue Ribbon Kennels as their broker, uh, as one of their main brokers uh, from 2016 to 2018, um, during the time of the uh, outbreak, and then they, they did stop using him as the outbreak went public. Um, and then now they, we uh, know that they have started using Levi Graber again. Um, so it seems like they stopped just as the public found out about all of this. And now, you know, now they're using them again. So not really a, a genuine. And, and I always wonder too, like, um, 
they could have someone here could have gotten sick from that during that time during the outbreak when when Arizona pet stores were using Levi Graber um, and we just don't know uh, the thing about these diseases is it's very difficult um, unless you know you really have a, a large cluster um, then you can identify that that you know that's where the disease is but if there was a, a one-off or two-off cases here and people just didn't associate it with the puppy they just brought home, it's very likely that people here could have also gotten sick during that outbreak. Isn't it funny how these pet stores find out that their supplier is doing this and there's all these things wrong and they continue to use them, but then have their same story about how much they care about the puppies and finding families their forever puppy. And I'm just like, if you did, you would switch well, you wouldn't be using puppy mills to begin with, but you would switch suppliers. The same thing happened here with Jax. I mean, this was an ongoing thing for what, almost two years, year and a half. And not once their answer, Puppy Land's answer was, we don't use Jax. I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> right. And really these brokers, you know, again, they're that middleman. They, they're still over, you know, there's oversight by the USDA, but they themselves are the ones that are the source of illnesses. So Campylobacter is just one zoonotic disease, but there is another zoonotic disease that can pass from dogs to humans, and that's brucellosis. And in Iowa last year, we had a huge brucellosis outbreak because a horrible 100 puppy mill decided to go out of business on paper. He actually started another breeding facility, which made a lot of people mad. That's normally what happens when there's a dog auction. They make a lot of money and then start a new facility. But anyway, um, this facility was selling off a couple hundred of their dogs and, you know, People showed up, members of the general public, rescues, other puppy mills. Um, everybody went to buy these dogs and they were the you know, ground zero of a disease called brucellosis, which is technically an STD for dogs. It, it passes between dogs who are unaltered and it can also pass uh, through urine and feces. But in some states, if a dog is brucellosis positive, it has to be euthanized. And if a kennel has brucellosis in it, they have to quarantine the dogs, test all the dogs repeatedly to find out if they have brucellosis and then euthanize the animals that do. But puppy mills do not test for this disease. It is not required to test for this disease. It is strongly suggested. And so every time there's a dog auction or every time one of these puppy mills is selling their dogs to the public, they always say, we tested a small amount of adult breeding dogs for brucellosis. They all tested negative. But what we've seen and what we've heard at these xeno facilities is they pump the adult breeding dogs full of antibiotics right before the test. So it wouldn't show up if they are brucellosis positive. And then by the time they're back with the rescue or in the hands of somebody who, you know, personal pet was bought at a dog auction, now that dog has brucellosis and it can transfer to humans and it can cause infertility and miscarriages in women. So these diseases can be stopped with, you know, if these facilities stopped mass producing animals the way they do. Yeah. And then uh, one of the other brokers I wanted to discuss is Pinnacle Pet, um, especially. <laughs> um, our pet stores here use Pinnacle Pet a lot um, to the degree that like one of the breeders that's listed the most on um, our the pet stores in Arizona are required to uh, list the breeder on the, the puppy's uh, cage at the pet store location and on their um, website as well. And I, uh, I noticed one of the breeders they use the most is Elaine Wilson, uh, Chris and Elaine Wilson. It's a very large puppy mill. They have 200 plus breeding dogs um, and they uh, they list them like crazy online. They list them like crazy um, on there, you know, when you go into the store. But if you look at the CVI data we have, I do not see a single CVI showing that Chris and Elaine Wilson um, puppies are coming into Arizona. So I suspect that it's one of the large brokers they're using, which is uh, they use uh, Pinnacle Pet and QD Kennels are the two uh, major ones used here in Arizona. But Pinnacle Pet is especially problematic because they have been caught in a whole bunch of uh, sick puppy cases where 
they've transported entire shipments of very, very sick puppies to pet stores and, and they um, got caught doing so. And um, it made the news and there were a few big cases. I think there was one in Florida and maybe New Jersey, I think. Um, and they, uh, Pinnacle Pet is owned by Josh Bateman. And he uh, also owns all the transport companies that transport out from Pinnacle Pet. And so one of the times that, uh, that they transported a huge shipment of puppies that were really, really sick, they caught them, uh, I think that was in Florida. I should have researched that first. <laughs> um, I, they caught that the transport company that was owned by Josh Bateman, that was you know this little offset of, of Pinnacle Pet, um, was um, not licensed with the USDA. They were not registered uh, with the USDA, so they were never under the inspection or oversight of the USDA. And so they uh, got in, in trouble for that, and the USDA required them to get licensed. And during that time that they were operating as puppy travelers, uh, unlicensed, um, they were transporting puppies to Arizona pet stores that whole time without, you know, any USDA oversight on that transport. So uh, Pinnacle Pets, a really, really big one that um, I, I think people should be aware of. I see Pinnacle Pet transporting to other smaller uh, pet stores and pet dealers throughout Arizona. And it's just, um, I've seen them transport small animals like ferrets um, into Arizona. So it's, yeah, th that's definitely one I want people to be aware of. If you hear of Pinnacle Pet, that's a huge broker um, for puppy mills and based in the Midwest and literally their existence in Neosho, Missouri has sprouted up, you know, hundreds of puppy mills in that whole area because it's easy for those breeders to, to just get started up and have Pinnacle Pet be their distributor. Right, and like you mentioned earlier, the puppy mill belt is where all of the puppy mills are. And that is typically where we see the most brokers as well. Missouri, Florida, Texas, and Iowa are the leading states for USDA brokers. And so these facilities, you know, like you said, are in the heart of a puppy mill county. And they are the ones who are, you know, buying from so many puppy mills. But what we start seeing when you look at the bigger picture of all these CVIs is different, different brokers sell to different states. So I don't know if they have an agreement or if they, you know, just partner with the stores and the stores are that loyal. But like, for example, there are two huge brokers in um, Nebraska. Becky Buzzboom owns one of them and Crittersville is another one. Crittersville sells exclusively, almost exclusively to Colorado pet stores. And he also, that facility also sells to South Dakota stores. And if you were listening to one of our earlier episodes, that is actually the broker who spoke out against us at a Colorado legislative hearing saying that we were lying about the puppies they source from. So what we're seeing in these facilities is that the trends are there. They're selling to these same states, to the same stores all the time. And there isn't a lot of overlap. So we're seeing, you know, Pinnacle Pet is selling to Arizona. They sell a ton of puppies on the East Coast as well. We see their puppies pop up in Pennsylvania, especially sometimes Massachusetts, sometimes Connecticut. So it's really interesting when you really start drawing out a map of where all of these puppy brokers are selling their dogs. It is always to the same stores, like loyal customers. And then the other thing where there's that web of secrecy is um, where these dealers, these brokers, or the owners of the broker of the broker companies, are also breeders themselves. So you know that just whole that adds a whole other <laughs> layer to this. Where um, I've seen where Josh Bateman, who owns Pinnacle, is listed as the breeder of of dogs that that his company was transporting. Um, and then I've seen also uh, Susie Reed is another uh, puppy mill breeder that we've seen. Uh, she's she's a puppy mill breeder and then a broker as well. She's licensed as a, a dealer. And um, so I I just always wonder like if the if Susie Reed, for instance, you know, like if she's a breeder and a broker, then it's kind of hard. Where do you draw the line as far as being able to prove where the puppies actually came from? Like that's. That makes it a little bit more sketchy, <laughs> just harder to figure out um, what, where, you know, do you just take their word for it or, 
you know, it's, and that makes our laws here in Arizona, where we have specific laws that say that we can't get from breeders with certain violations on their record. That just makes that so much muddier to try to enforce, which, I mean, they've broken that law. Um, our pet stores here have broken that law and we can't get it enforced. So, <laughs> um, and, th and there you go. That's why it, it gets so complex. And I think us three here are probably the only people in the whole country that are even knowledgeable enough to enforce that law. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it, if your state is considering doing what Arizona did and what Ohio did, just no, no. no. <laughs> it was <laughs> suggested here and I was like, no, it's not happening. <laughs> and this is why brokers just muddy up the whole process of being able to track where puppies actually come from when they're coming from puppy mills. So I can't believe we haven't talked about this yet, but you know, when, when puppy mills decide to cancel their license and get a new one, mm -hmm. just to hide from past violations, I'm very shocked that we haven't talked about that yet. But what we see <laughs> often is that these puppy brokers do the same thing. They will bounce back and forth from a breeder license to a broker license. And technically you don't need that broker or dealer license to also breed dogs. Um, but they will hop back and forth often to hide from previous violations. But it's that really weird, murky license that that they have that they can obtain. Yeah. Uh, so here in Washington, just going back to talking about how much volume these brokers do, like how many puppies they're purchasing from puppy mills and distributing in Washington alone um, for 2020 two pet stores, so Farmland, who no longer can sell puppies thanks to an ordinance, and Puppyland, they imported 1,700 puppies from brokers, whereas Fairwood, who sources directly from breeders, only imported 88 puppies. So the, these brokers are pulling tons and tons of puppies and importing hundreds of puppies every single month just between two pet stores here in Washington. And that goes like Jack's supplies 20 different states with puppy mill puppies to different pet stores. So the numbers are huge with just how many they can supply. Right. Yeah, and um, here in Arizona, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I see something very similar where um, on our CVI data, uh, we see that the brokers will bring in like 78 puppies in one shipment. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, and then these other breeders uh, that are sending their puppies will, uh, there will be like one litter or, you know, five or six puppies at a time or three or four. Um, and then, but yeah, the, and then the brokers will have a shipment of, of like 78 just all at once. And it, it's really, really crazy. <laughs> They're, and go ahead. <laughs> We all love talking. Right. <laughs> we miss each other so much. Um, I was going to say really vaguely, because we'll probably do a whole episode on the puppy laundering scheme later, but brokers are the heart of the puppy laundering scheme because a lot of states, you know, they either don't have oversight for rescues or the rescues like here in Iowa, um, if you're a dog shelter, an animal shelter, or a pound, you have a specific license. If you are licensed as a rescue, there's no such thing. So you're automatically licensed as a dealer. So when Jack's puppies decided to become licensed as Hobo Canine Rescue and Rescue Pets Iowa, they basically just got a dealer license on the state level. So this broker got a broker license on the state level to quote unquote rescue. And that's what we saw in Ohio most recently, a horrible hundred, a two time horrible hundred puppy mill was a broker and they also got a rescue license. So that is really the heart of this puppy laundering scheme. It is the USDA dog brokers that are trying to find loopholes to break local and state ordinances that refuse, that make it illegal to sell puppy mill puppies. Yeah, we had a case like that here in Arizona. We had a, a pet store called Puppy World that was only open very briefly. Uh, Same thing here. Thanks to some strong advocates in Tucson. Thank you, Tucson advocates, for for going after this store. But they they uh, were a pet store from California, and California passed a law, you know, banning pet stores from getting puppies from puppy mills statewide. And um, they tried to circumvent the law there by getting from these fake rescues that are actually just puppy brokers. 
And then they try, then they carried that on over here to Arizona. They opened up shop um, in the Marana, Arizona, which is down by Tucson. And they did the same exact thing. They, they were calling themselves a rescue, quote unquote, but they had dogs for thousands of dollars and they were offering financing and, um, and then they were using a fake rescue, Pet Connect Rescue, um, but they were calling them adoptions and using the rescue word. And, um, but this broker, this Pet Connect Rescue, uh, we have a whole uh, thing about them on our blog. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're, it's a dog broker that's operating as, as a rescuer. It's a puppy mill broker. Um, so yeah, we, we have a case of that here recently that luckily that pet store is now shut down, but, um, it, I wouldn't put it past any pet store to, to do that, that to start just getting from a broker that's going to call themselves a rescue if they need to. So you should tell the most recent story of that sick puppy that was sold from that pet store. Oh yeah. There was a puppy that was sold uh, that it was puppy world in Marana, Arizona. They sold a, a little Yorkie puppy to a couple and the couple uh, took the Yorkie home. Of course, puppy got really, really sick, found, took him to the vet, found out um, after thousands of dollars in vet bills, they found out this puppy only has one lung, literally just had one lung. And so very extreme genetic issues obviously going on there. And um, so they went to the pet store to return the puppy and they found that the pet store was closed and they were finding out the pet store was closed at the same time that uh, some local advocates were there. Um, luckily Gary, um, shout out to Gary in Tucson, he's awesome. <laughs> he was there to intercept and um, and kind of, you know, was asked them what was going on. And they said, well, we had to put our puppy to sleep. Um, and we're, you know, in debt thousands of dollars. And they, you know, we, we came to, to um, remedy that at the pet store because Arizona does have little puppy lemon laws where they're required to uh, remedy these if they sell sick puppies like that. And the pet store is closed. So now they're out thousands of dollars in vet bills, thousands for the puppy that they owe through the financing companies, which are completely separate from the pet stores, but the pet stores refer them to. So now they owe that finance company. And now, um, you know, now they don't have a puppy and the pet store wasn't even open anymore to remedy that. They had to close up because they were operating in this way. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's just really, really tragic. And there's not a lot that can be done. I mean, they, they can complain, certainly complain to the attorney general's office um, and they should complain to the attorney general's office in Arizona and in uh, where that puppy came from. I'm not sure where the breeder was, but they should also complain um, in that state that this breeder is selling, you know, these horrifically deformed puppies. Um, but yeah, there, other than that, just filing a complaint, there's, what do you do? Like these, these poor families, you know, right before Christmas is just really, really set back by this, these awful stores and, and these puppy mills and what they're doing. Yeah. So that was we really- get that question a lot. I'm sure all of us have of what can we do, you know, like when people mm -hmm. get a sick puppy and it's, it's sad, but filing complaints, like you said, is really all you can do. And even that sometimes it's like, we, these laws are in place, but nobody enforces them, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And our listeners are typically animal advocates. So you guys listening, please be patient and be kind with people who bought sick puppies. So when, you know, we post these stories on our social media channels, literally all of the comments are people saying, well, it's their fault. It's their fault. They were too dumb. They shouldn't have bought this puppy but the public doesn't know. And at one time I didn't know when I was that person who bought a puppy and every single email we receive, we treat that person the same way I, I wanted to be treated. You know, you have to treat them with kindness and compassion because they had no idea. And now they have to learn the hard way. They have to learn from their mistakes. So please, before you post on Facebook or before you think wrongly about these pet store employees, those young women from our last episode, who we all think are the enemy because they're supporting this industry. They didn't know better. And now they do. 
the people who bought sick puppies, they didn't know better and now they do. So we have to keep showing them kindness and compassion and avoid being so, so negative because we all kind of get wrapped up in that negativity sometimes. And we wish puppy mills didn't exist and we know the public is funding them, but education is key and being angry and being nasty and being mean to these customers isn't going to help them out of their situation. And it's not going to bring them to our side to learn that puppy mills are bad. Right. And if they're not coming and talking to us and we're not able to help them, you know, file those complaints, even though, yes, it's hard to get those things enforced, it's still important for them to learn, hey, this is where they actually came from and follow through with those complaints, because the same thing goes even for those different agencies. The more people that hear about it and learn about this industry, the better. And that's really what's going to make the difference is more people learning about it. And we're seeing that across the country with uh, attorney general's offices across the country are starting to pick up on this puppy mill issue, on this pet store issue, because of all the complaints that are being filed. So when it right. when it happens in large numbers like that, when it you think it's just you, but you don't know how many dozens of other people may have filed complaints and it takes filing that complaint to add up to uh, some actual action from these law enforcement agencies. Um, but yeah, that we're seeing, they're starting to notice that pet stores and puppy mills are a problem nationwide and the attorney general's offices in states across the country are starting to pick up on that and go after it. So it you really, it's, it's really important if you're listening to this and you came about it um, because you bought a puppy from a pet store or you know somebody who did, or, or you're an advocate and somebody complained to you, please, please, please encourage them to file complaints. We at Bailing Out Benji can help them. They can find us on our website and uh, we can help them file those complaints. But we, we have a whole list of agencies to file complaints to, and we will help them file the exact, you know, we'll, we'll send the exact links of where they need to file a complaint or the exact email address. Uh, will help them throughout that entire process. So those that's a really, really important thing for people to do is uh, to know to, that those complaints have to be filed, even if it feels arbitrary, like nothing's going to happen. Right. Yeah. When one person emails us about a sick puppy, we typically have them file no fewer than five extra complaints. And we make it very easy for them, but they have to file complaints in the state they live, complaints in the state the puppy was born, the attorney generals, sometimes the USDA, and all that, you know, it's often a copy and paste version of what they sent us already but making sure every complaint is so filed or is filed completely and accurately. Jack's puppies had their two fake rescues shut down by the Iowa Attorney General. The Florida Attorney General is investigating several pet land stores for sick puppies. The Maryland Attorney General is investigating pet stores that are breaking their law. So this does happen. We just all need to work together to make sure the right complaints are being filed. Yeah, and, and it takes being nice to those people who are reaching out to you for help because they bought a puppy and they didn't know where it came from. And the biggest takeaway, that, that actually is the biggest takeaway we want from this episode about puppy brokers is that when you buy a pet store, a pet store puppy or you order a dog online, you really, really don't know where it came from. There's no way to know where the dog came from unless you yourself went to a breeder in person. Uh, we would hope you would rescue or adopt and go to a shelter or rescue. But if you're going to get a dog from a breeder and you just click and ship order online, they could tell you anything. They could say whatever is going to get you to purchase that puppy. They have something to gain from this, which is your money. Um, but it there's so many layers of secrecy that people just have no idea. And these puppy brokers are, are just the exact, you know, that's the perfect example of how many layers of secrecy are, are piled onto this issue and separating those puppy mill breeders from pet stores um, by just a whole other element. So um, yeah, that's the biggest takeaway is, is don't order a dog online. Um, don't go to a pet store and make sure if you're going to get it from a breeder, you meet that breeder in person at their own home. You don't want to meet them out at a grocery store or something like that. You just don't know where that puppy came from. 
And you want to make sure you're getting a puppy from someone who actually cared about the mama dog, um, who was giving that mama dog lots of love and vet care and, and socialization. And dogs were meant to live alongside humans. Literally, that's how we evolved together. So we want to always make sure that that cruelty is taken out of that um, purchase and that you're at least getting a dog from somebody who lives with their pet <laughs> and is treating it like a family member, like we all do with our pets. So um, yeah, don't ever, I, I, if you take away anything from this episode, <laughs> just know that there's layers upon layers of secrecy in this industry. And so, December is prime puppy buying season. So anyone listening, we need your help. We need you to help educate, share our posts on Facebook, on Instagram, just get the word out because right now the public is looking into buying Christmas puppies. And this time of year, we get so many sick puppy complaints because the puppy they bought was sick or it died a few days afterwards. So making sure that the public knows before is crucial and we need your help doing that. Yeah, um, we get the comment a lot, like when we post something generic about pet store puppies coming from puppy mills or anything generic, I always see the comment of, doesn't everybody know that? No. <laughs> if they did, we wouldn't have pet stores selling puppies. Yeah, we I wouldn't mean, have puppy mills. <laughs> right. Yeah. So no, you can't share that message enough. You cannot, it, you have yeah. to keep sharing that message out there to your friends and family. You have no idea who doesn't know about this. I literally, like the other day, my brother texted me and he's like, is there a way to tell if there's a Brittany Spaniel puppy mill in New Mexico? And I'm like, <laughs> he's my brother and he knows nothing about puppy mills. Like the, this, this whole question was, and you know, I was just like blown away. Like, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> if a breeder specializes in one breed, that is a good sign and not a red flag. <laughs> right. Specialize. Um, but, you know, and then I sent him our article from our website on uh, how do you tell a puppy mill versus a reputable breeder? So, um, yeah, you'd be surprised who doesn't know. Like, I thought I posted enough about all this. I <laughs> dedicate my life to it. I thought, you know, my own brother would know, but he just kind of vaguely knows what I do. And he had no idea about the specifics on, you know, if he wanted to get a Britney Spaniel, I'm going to encourage him to adopt, by the way. He's not going to get that. <laughs> but <laughs> but at least, you know, I, I want him to know how you would be able to tell a, a good breeder from one of those puppy mill breeders. So, and yeah. when we say good breeder, we mean the, the puppy mill cruelty level of it taken out. We're not going to get into the whole thing of, you know, people shouldn't breed while there's dogs in shelters and rescues. We personally wouldn't buy a dog from a breeder, uh, but the public's going to do what it's going to do. And we're going to try to take that cruelty out of the, out of the equation and encourage people to make better decisions than the decisions they were going to make originally. That's exactly so, right. I couldn't say yeah. it any better myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, uh, now we made it to episode five and, um, there was just a few things that we wanted to, um, throw out there. We have a fundraiser going on right now. And it's um, 15K in 15 days. Uh, we have a matching uh, donor who wants to match $15,000 in donations this month. So if you can donate anything, even if it's a dollar or $2, um, we have a matching donor this month. So your, your donation is going to be doubled if you donate um, in the next couple of weeks. So please, please, please consider donating to us, especially if you learned something from these podcasts or from our website or our maps or anything. Um, please consider helping us out. The pandemic's been really harsh for nonprofits. So yeah. Um, and then is there anything else you wanted to bring up, Mindy? I was just going to say, I know Ashley has something to talk about, but um, our t-shirts are available as well. If you're looking for holiday gifts, please go to our website. It's the donate link on our website, and you can see all of our amazing t-shirts that we have for sale. 
all of the proceeds go to help us continue our efforts and they make the best holiday gifts. People love how comfy they are. They love the catchy slogans. So please consider, you know, shopping at your local pet store that's humane or, you know, supporting that nonprofit during this holiday season. And speaking of holiday gifts, we also have partnered with uh, Grounds and Hounds. So they make coffee, they have coffee accessories like mugs, uh, different like cold brew type things. They even have stuff for your dog. So you will save 15% and then 10% gets donated back to us thanks to Grounds and Hounds. So if you use our code bailing out Benji, all one word, uh, when you check out, that'll apply that discount code. Or uh, we also have a direct link, which is linked in our Instagram bio. It'll take you directly to that. So that's groundsandhoundscoffee.com. They have lots of cute stuff and delicious coffee. Nice. My, my last little plug, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video and leave a comment. The more interactions we get on YouTube, the more people see our videos. And if you're listening on a podcast, please rate and subscribe and review us. I think right now, as of uh, tonight, we have 11 reviews or 11 ratings on our podcast app. But the more you review and you rate our podcast and other wonderful podcasts out there, the more we're suggested to others who have similar interests. So I know we're learning and, you know, every episode we're, we're talking about a different topic, but if you can please just leave us a review, like us on YouTube, like our videos, help us grow, please. Cause we cannot do this without you. And then uh, one final little thing I just wanted to bring up because we talked about this earlier. Um, we're all advocates and this is a small nonprofit and we get really tired. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, things are rough right now. It's uh, the country is going through a lot. So uh, we took off this weekend. Um, I think all of us like took a lot of time off this long weekend with Thanksgiving Um even though we were just hanging out at home and, and just kind of laying back, like we, we didn't, I, I know I tried not to check my email. I tried not to look at text messages and, and all the, the puppy mill stuff that was coming at me. And I know Mindy did the same thing. Ashley, you, did you do that this week? I did. Yes. It was hard. <laughs> Cause I get my email to my phone and I was like, don't open it. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you're an advocate, we totally feel you on that. Um, you it takes some time off and unplug, and or if you're not an advocate, if you're just a person, just take some time off and unplug. <laughs> it feels so good. I feel so much more refreshed and now that I had that long weekend and I, you know, did I, I focused on on my family and my household and not you know all these million other things and it felt really really good for once. So yeah, everybody, please take care of yourselves and wear your masks and be safe yes. and wash your hands and <laughs> stay socially distant and hopefully so we can we be ungrounded one day. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully we can get through this, um, this winter. It's, it's going to be rough, but we, we need to be as safe and healthy and happy as we possibly can and taking care of ourselves. So thank you, everybody. Do you guys have anything yes. else you want to add? I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good eve or well day. You, you're who knows when you're lo we're watching this. Have a good day, evening, <laughs> morning. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Truth, Lies, and Puppy Mills, a bailing out Benji production. We hope you were able to learn something in today's episode, and we also hope that you take that knowledge and use it to educate your friends and family as well. Please subscribe to this podcast on any of your favorite podcast apps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Bailing Out Benji. If you'd like to support our mission to end puppy mills, especially if we were able to teach you something new today, please consider making a donation on our website at www.bailingoutbenji.com. Bailing Out Benji is a small nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and providing the most current and accurate data regarding the puppy mill industry. We appreciate all of our listeners. Please stay safe, love your pets, and be kind to animals, and we'll see you next week. <music>